Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last year I put together the animated battle map for Stones River and began with January 2nd. In this video, we're going to go back to December 31st. After the disastrous Kentucky campaign, the Confederate Army of Tennessee had marched back into East Tennessee and then prepared for a movement against Nashville. The whole campaign had just cost needless death and a tactical victory but strategic defeat for the Confederate Army's commander, Braxton Bragg, and the tens of thousands of Kentuckians he theorized that would flock into his invading army did not materialize. President of the Confederacy Jefferson Davis approved the movement made into Middle Tennessee and the Army of Tennessee started its march. Union General William Stark Rosecrans replaced General Don Carlos Buell as commander of the newly named Army of the Cumberland. Previously, Rosecrans had done good service in the assaults against Corinth, Mississippi. Abraham Lincoln, who back in September had issued the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, knew that the full proclamation would take effect on January 1st, and he needed victories to validate taking such a strong action. In the East, General Ambrose Burnside led the Union Army of the Potomac during one of the Union's most disastrous defeats. This next engagement would do much to calm the nerves of the President. Throughout November and into December, the Confederate cavalry commands of Nathan Bedford Forrest and John Hunt Morgan had plagued Rosecrans' army, who was preparing for their own movement against the Confederates occupying Murfreesboro. However, in late December, Bragg sent both Forrest and Morgan on raids into West Tennessee and Kentucky, respectively, leaving only the cavalry under Joseph Wheeler to act as the eyes and ears of the army. Rosecrans wasted no time in moving once those threats were gone, and he moved his army along three routes the day after Christmas. The Union commander brought with him around 40,000 men, leaving a great deal in Nashville to guard the city and supply lines. Bragg's force in Murfreesboro numbered about 35,000 troops. Bragg asked Brigadier General John A. Wharton how long he could delay the advancing Federals. Four days was the cavalry commander's reply. Wharton did a good job of harassing the Union army, but it was the weather, the rain and sleet and mud that truly slowed down the blue troops. By December 30th, Rosecrans' tired force was just a few miles from Murfreesboro. Also on that day, Alexander McCook's right wing aggressively probed the Confederate line, but by sunset both armies prepared for the carnage of the next day. The Army of Tennessee was firmly dug in, and all Bragg had to do was wait for an attack and crush it in similar fashion to the way Robert E. Lee had done at Fredericksburg. However, Bragg went on the offensive. He shifted Hardy's Corps west to extend the Confederate line. He planned on attacking the vulnerable Union right flank, push into the Union Army's rear, and cut it off from Nashville. It was a bold move, and he was assembling an able-bodied force to conduct that attack. Conversely, Rosecrans was making plans to attack the next morning as well. Just like Bragg, he was going to use the troops on his left to fracture the Confederate right and cut the Army of Tennessee off from Murfreesboro. Both plans had their problems. One, Bragg hoped that once the army began falling back, that he could keep the momentum going. But if they couldn't, their only reserve was three miles and a river crossing away. Two, Rosecrans' assault columns would need at least an hour after daybreak to get across Stones River to make their attack. Plus, the Union right was extremely vulnerable. The wing commander, Alexander McCook, issued no orders to his troops in how to prepare, and the division commander on the extreme right was an incompetent general. It was ultimately going to come down to who attacked first, and in this case, it would be Bragg. The divisions of McCown and Claiborne positioned their men to overlap the Union right flank and were to be the sledgehammer against the Union line. During the night of December 30th, both sides battled back and forth, but not with rifles and artillery, but with music. The Union bands began playing Yankee Doodle and the Confederate bands played Dixie. Eventually, both sides broke out into the same song, Home Sweet Home. As many of the soldiers sat in the cold, wet mud, shivering in the winter weather, many began to cry as the musicians played their melodic tunes. At 6 a.m., Union soldiers on the right flank slept and milled about their makeshift camps until their very own skirmishers ran through their lines, yelling, Here they come! Indeed, the Confederate attack was launching. McCown and Claiborne's men raced toward the enemy and slammed into Johnson's division of McCook's wing. The power with which the rebel lines hit the blue troops caused the Union flank to dissolve, and McCown's men pursued, raising the rebel yell, striking fear into the hearts of the retreating Federals. It looked like Bragg's plan had worked, and success was inevitable. However, there was a problem. 
Although McCown's men had done their job well, instead of performing a wheeling motion to the right in order to attack the Union regiments from the rear, his division went further to the west, opening up a wide gap in the Confederate line. Within less than an hour, the Union troops were on the run, but the battle was quickly coming apart for the Confederates. The adept Major General Patrick Claiborne, who was supposed to be acting as support for McCown, saw the gap and slipped his division into it. That's all he could have done, but now the punching power of the Confederate left was diminished. Amidst all the confusion, Brigadier General August Willock, the Prussian soldier turned American general, attempted to rally his troops, but found himself attempting to rally Confederates instead. He was taken prisoner and sent to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia. There were a few standout commanders attempting to stem the Confederate tide. Colonel Post and his brigade swung back to the right, forming a line nearly perpendicular to his original placement. Elements of Claiborne's division under Bushrod Johnson and St. John Liddell attacked Post's men, and only the threat of his flank being turned forced Post to pull his men back toward the Gresham House. Colonel Philemon Baldwin was supposed to be in reserve, but once he heard the sound of battle, he had mobilized his brigade and went south. Post's men streamed past Baldwin, whose infantry and artillery checked the Confederate advance. McNair's brigade hit Baldwin in the flank, and his line, like all the rest, melted away under the pressure. On Claiborne's right, the brigade of Colonel William Carlin was hit by Wood's brigade in the front and Lucius Polk's brigade in the right flank. To the northeast, and at the same time that Wood's men were hit in Carlin's line, Colonel Loomis led his brigade against Woodruff's men, but the devastating fire from a Federal sent Loomis's men back. An artillery shell struck a tree and it fell on Loomis, and he was helped off the field. Behind Loomis was Vaughn's brigade, who tried their hand at attacking the Union line, but they were thrown back as well. However, Claiborne's men, after flanking Carlin's brigade, moved on Woodruff's flank, and the blue dominoes continued to fall. When the gray attackers got to Philip Sheridan's division, they encountered a little bit more resistance. Brigadier General Joshua Seal defended the right of Sheridan's line, and although the 36th Illinois and the 88th Illinois were swept aside by Manigault's attack, the 24th Wisconsin and 21st Michigan held out along with some artillery support. Then, as Seal was attempting to organize a counterattack, a bullet struck him in the head, killing him instantly. The rest of the brigade began to withdraw, but a few well-placed artillery volleys punctured the flank of Manigault's line and made them back away. The rebels returned, but with reinforcements, and shattered the Union line. Rosecrans quickly realized that his own plan to outflank the rebels was not going to be possible, and he quickly set about maneuvering more troops toward the right flank. The Union line was now bent back on itself and was in a precarious position, attempting to defend the vital Nashville Pike, its connection to the capital. It was around 10 a.m. and the day was firmly in Confederate hands.